gentlemen, please take your seats, ladies and gentlemen. We can now officially kick off the afternoon session of the 13th edition of the State of the Union Conference here in Florence. Hello as well to all those watching us online. I believe there was around 4,000 of you this morning, so thank you very much for being with us from a distance, and thank you so much for sharing all your comments on social media. Now, without further ado, I would like to invite up here on stage Antonio Mazzeo, the president of the Tuscany region, to share with us some opening words. And we'll also be joined by Carlo Corazza. He's the head of the European Parliament Liaison Office here in Italy. Gentlemen. <laughs> Buongiorno, buongiorno a tutte, buongiorno a tutti, benvenuti a Firenze, benvenuti in Toscana. Noi siamo davvero orgogliosi di poter ospitare una manifestazione così importante come The State of the Union. Grazie a tutti per essere qui e per il supporto che potrete darci. Sappiamo bene che l'Europa non è un'idea astratta, lo sappiamo come regione che vuole essere centrale rispetto alle politiche europee. L'Europa è il futuro, ma soprattutto il presente per tante ragazze e tanti ragazzi che vogliono costruire le proprie opportunità, i propri sogni. L'Europa deve essere una comunità che si tiene insieme e che cerca di offrire più diritti, più prospettive, più opportunità. Non sempre è accaduto, non sempre accade e questo bisogno lo sentiamo ancora più forte in un tempo difficile come quello che stiamo vivendo. L'Europa vive tempi incerti, così come avete intitolato questo momento di confronto, questi giorni di confronto. Emergenze globali in cui noi, le istituzioni, ci sentiamo piccole, a volte non in grado di dare tutte le risposte che possono servire. La pandemia, il cambiamento climatico, l'ingiustificato, il violento, la violenta aggressione che la Russia sta portando al cuore dell'Europa, all'Ucraina e le sue devastanti conseguenze. Però noi abbiamo un compito come istituzioni, quello di cercare di trasferire, di trasmettere speranza per un futuro migliore. E l'Europa deve essere questo, deve essere fonte di ispirazione per ciascuno di noi, deve, deve essere un modo per costruire eh, condizioni di vita più giusta e non sempre anche questo è accaduto. Però è un tempo in cui le regioni, i consigli regionali sono e saranno ancora più fondamentali per accorciare le distanze tra le istituzioni europee e i cittadini, perché poi l'obiettivo alla fine è sempre di offrire risposte migliori alle cittadine e ai cittadini dei nostri territori. Queste distanze le colmiamo anche grazie alle risorse che arrivano dal Piano Nazionale di Ripresa e Resilienza e vi voglio fare tre esempi concreti che riguardano la nostra Regione. Grazie a quelle risorse noi dal primo di settembre riusciremo ad offrire eh, alle famiglie toscane con un ISEE sotto i 35 mila euro la possibilità di dare a tutti gli asili nido gratuiti. Senza quelle risorse noi non lo potevamo fare, non avremmo le, avuto le condizioni per farlo. Grazie a quelle risorse realizzeremo 85 case di comunità per portare il servizio sanitario vicino ai, ai cittadini. Grazie a quelle risorse consentiremo a 550.000 cittadini ed imprese toscane di avere internet ad alta velocità. Io penso che l'Europa sia anche questa e l'Europa si, si debba porre un obiettivo, cioè si debba porre l'obiettivo di fare in modo che un bimbo che nasce anche nel più piccolo borgo della nostra regione debba avere gli stessi diritti di un bimbo che nasce in Baviera o in Scandinavia. Non è semplice, ma è l'impegno che come istituzioni portiamo avanti. Grazie davvero a tutti voi, grazie all'Istituto per il lavoro enorme che fa e noi siamo orgogliosi di avere ogni anno qui questo evento. Grazie. Grazie mille, thank you so much. And we'd now like to invite up Mr. Carlo Corazza, the head of the European Parliament Liaison Office here in Italy. Welcome. Thank you. 
Thank you. Thank you very much. My warm thank to the European Institute of uh, University Institute in Florence. We are really admired by the, this, this new edition of the State of the Union, and the European Parliament is very glad to support uh, this edition. And we are also very happy to see so many members of the Parliament participating to this edition. In the last uh, decade, the, the European Union had to face uh, several crises the banking crisis, the debt crisis, the migration crisis was still going on, then the pandemic, and now this brutal aggression of Russia to Ukraine, which also worsened the energy crisis. And let's be honest, we not always provide the effective answer to this crisis. And it's not just a problem of political willingness of leadership, it's a problem of the limit of the European integration. Sometimes we don't have the instrument, the right instrument, the appropriate instrument to provide answer to this crisis. This is why the European Parliament strongly believes that it's time to have an ambitious agenda of reform and change. We opened a conference on the future of Union on the 2021. Last year, my president, Roberta Mezzola, closed this conference, the 9th of May, indicating clearly that we need the change also of the treaty to have a more democratic and effective union and to provide answer to our citizens. Several, uh, uh, some weeks ago, the European Parliament presented a study on the cost of non-Europe. The cost of non-Euro is 2.8 trillion per year because we are not capable of an energy union, an energy of defense, a real foreign policy, a real integration. So this is the debate that we expect to have in view of the next uh, European election, and we, we are very grateful to the University Institute of Florence to having started this debate today. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Carlo Corazza, for that speech. Um, and now, ladies and gentlemen, as promised earlier, it's time now to invite up on stage the Swedish Minister of Foreign Affairs, Tobias Bilstrom. As you all know, Sweden is now holding the reins and chairing the European Union. It's just gone halfway through, so we thought it'd be a great idea to invite him here to the State of the Union to tell, him, tell us how things are going and what is left to do. So, ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together, please, for Tobias Bilstrom, the Minister of Foreign Affairs, from Sweden. Excellencies, uh, fellow Europeans, I'm honored to uh, have been invited to speak here today in a place commonly uh, associated with a peri period in history, the Renaissance that marked a new beginning. Perhaps the symbolism is more significant than in a long time. This past year has seen a reaffirmation of the strength of the European Union, an unprecedented unity and resolve. It is a testament to the relevance and importance of our cooperation and to our collective strength. Following Russia's brutal, full-scale invasion of Ukraine, a free and sovereign democracy, Europe finds itself in a new era. The war continues to inflict immense human suffering. We are facing the most serious foreign, security, and defense policy challenges since the Second World War. Through its unprovoked aggression against Ukraine, Russia has demonstrated the utter disregard for the fundamental principles of international law and the UN Charter, and for the European security order. At the same time, Russia has isolated itself completely from the rest of Europe. Russia's war of aggression runs counter to everything we believe in. It is not only an unjustified attack on a sovereign, peaceful nation, but also a war about values and rules-based international cooperation. Responding to this war and providing support for Ukraine's freedom and sovereignty have been the EU's main task this past year. The EU's response has been swift, has been determined, together with our transatlantic partners, NATO and global allies, we have stood united on the foundation of our shared values of sovereignty and self-determination. I'm convinced that the unity we have demonstrated remains our greatest asset in this endeavor. Europe must continue to build on the work that we have done this year to safeguard the security of our continent. Sweden assumed the rotating 
presidency of the Council of the European Union at a time of historic challenges for member states and the EU, a time when foreign and security policy is at the heart of the EU agenda. Sweden's support for Ukraine is unwavering. Our priorities is providing as much support as possible to Ukraine, politically, financially, militarily, and increasing the pressure on Russia. I'm pleased to name some of the concrete achievements under the Swedish presidency on the Council of the EU. A tenth package of sanctions adopted to weaken Russia's ability to maintain its war machine, the new EU Working Party on the use of frozen Russian assets to support Ukraine's reconstruction, the adoption of a seventh tranche worth 500 million euros under the European Peace Facility, and last but not least, the new International Centre for the Prosecution of the Crime of Aggression. These steps have been taken while at the same time providing substantial humanitarian assistance to Ukraine and Moldova, trade-related support, robust macro-financial assistance to stabilize Ukraine's economy and maintain its basic public services and capacity to the Ukrainian armed forces through EU's military and civilian missions, EU MAM Ukraine and EU AM Ukraine. The war has highlighted that the enlargement process is our most effective and strategic tool for building stability and security in our neighborhood. The EU has a strategic interest in and a responsibility for responding to the EU aspirations of the countries of the enlargement process. We must do our utmost to support the EU integration of Ukraine, of Moldova, and of Georgia. During the Swedish EU presidency, Ukraine has taken important reform steps, including anti-corruption measures. A merit-based and credible EU accession process is how we can help Ukraine reform and win the peace. Therefore, it is crucial to the European security order that we continue to support and encourage Ukraine uh, uh, reform efforts. As the enlargement process is the key to the stability in our region, Sweden has also worked actively to keep the EU integration process of the Western Balkan high on the agenda. The Swedish presidency is advancing the Council's work under the guiding principles of making the EU greener, safer and freer. To secure lasting peace on our continent, the EU must become a stronger and more coherent geopolitical and security actor, both globally and in our neighbourhood. To this end, we look forward to the adoption of a new civilian CSDP compact as part of the implementation of a strategic compass at the next Foreign Affairs Council. The establishment of a civilian EU mission in Armenia under the CSDP, the EU military partnership in Niger, and the EU partnership mission in Moldova are other very welcomed examples of steps taken by the Council this spring. In this new and geopolitically turbulent era, the EU's cooperation with international partners is a natural priority for the Swedish presidency. And EU efforts to this end include the recent joint declaration on EU-NATO cooperation, the Windsor framework between the UK and the EU, the ambition to adopt the post-Cotonou partnership agreement, progress in the FTA negotiations with Australia and in concluding trade agreements with New Zealand, with Chile and Mexico, the announcement of a relaunch of negotiations for an EU-Thailand FTA and the EU Indo-Pacific Ministerial Forum to be held in Stockholm in May. The Swedish Presidency also looks forward to hosting the EU-US Trade and Technology Council TTC in Luleå in the north of Sweden at the end of this month. And these are just some examples of the items on EU's busy agenda. Today's security challenges are complex, ranging from conventional military threats to hybrid attacks on increased technological competition. The past year has shown 
that the European Union is uniquely equipped to meet these challenges. I remain convinced that tackling the security threats of today and of tomorrow is best done together and in partnership with allies who share our commitment of defending democracy and the rules-based world order. These are perilous times, indeed, but they bring with them renewed opportunities for cooperation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Minister. Um, great to get a bit of an insight into there how your couple of months have been so far. You mentioned, of course, the achievements, but tell us as well about the lows and the challenges. Bring us behind the scenes of the Swedish presidency. <laughs> well, um, as we all know, the presidency is never done in a vacuum. There constantly creeps up things and challenges which you have to face. Uh, one thing which I really would like to highlight is when you have a natural catastrophe striking one of your neighbors, as in this case uh, happened to both Turkey and to Syria. And the Swedish EU presidency responded immediately. I called my colleague, the foreign minister Mevlo Cavusoglu, on the evening of the earthquake to inform him that we were going immediately to launch uh, the um, hosting of a donors conference to bring money to the relief of those affected by this horrible earthquake, the worst that has happened in a hundred years to the region of, of where Turkey and Syria is, is located. This is one, I think, very important example to, to bring forward. The war in Ukraine is, of course, uh, also a logic answer to your question. And that has, has its, its ups and downs, but as I said in my speak, speech, there has been no other thing, I think, on the agenda when it comes to foreign and security policy that has posed so many threats and challenges. Mm. And just on the war in Ukraine and trying to stop the war in Ukraine, you mentioned Sweden presiding over the 10th package of sanctions. We hear that as we speak, there is an 11th set of sanctions being drafted, and perhaps we will have news of that on Monday. What more can you tell us about them? Well, I have been saying many times when I've been asked about the value of the sanctions that they are invaluable. The sanctions are the method whereby the EU has shown that we are able to put more than one spike in the wheel of a Russian war machine. But it's not just a question of, of adding new sanctions, it is also a question of following up the sanctions already in place. And more importantly, to see to it that Russia is not able to circumvent the challenges that has been put in place. And with this package, I think we will see, uh, we will see uh, progress on this file. And on that sanctions circumvention, the EU has appointed an official, David O'Sullivan. Is, is he managing to do the job he was asked to do? Certainly. I think that when we look at it, the ability, however, of one person is, is <laughs> that, that's, uh, you know, inferior to the, the unity that the European Union has displayed throughout this war. It was our unity, our ability to quickly respond to the threats that Russia posed that provided us with the necessary energy, the tools, the mechanisms that led to us so quickly bringing forward uh, the sanctions that, that, that brought down uh, parts of the Russian economy. And I think that this, uh, this uh, appointment is, is one important key factor as well. And just going back to the sanctions package, um, Russian diamonds have so far been exempt. Could we see them? Well, um, as the presidency, it is our job to conduct negotiations, and uh, perhaps this stage is uh, not the, uh, the best place to do it. Uh, but uh, I would like to say that, of course, uh, these are one of the items which are being looked into. Again, circumvent, circumventing the already existing sanctions is something which we have to prohibit and hinder to the best of our ability. And today, uh, this morning, on many of the panels, we heard about the unity still very much being there. But then we saw a presentation this morning as well about the solidarity among EU member states perhaps dwindling regarding support for Ukraine and also support for the European Union. Mm. Is that something that you've noticed as well? Well, the, our ability as a strategic player of the EU to show that we are able to cooperate is a shining beacon, a good example for other countries as well. And we should reach out to other countries around the world 
especially now when we see the vote in the, the UN General Assembly, and show them what this war is all about. And I keep thinking about this when I meet countries of Eastern Europe, uh, not at least the Baltic states. What good examples they are to lift forward to countries in Africa and talk about what this war is about. This war is a good old-fashioned colonial imperial war. Something we, we thought that we had left behind after the Second World War, when we said that empires were no longer feasible, empires was a thing of the past, we established the, the UN Charter, we wrote things re referring to the crime of aggression, etc. All in retrospect of the, the, the horrible endeavors of the Second World War. What Russia is doing now is a good old-fashioned colonial war, and we should show and tell to the countries of Africa and, and Asia and Latin America what this is all about. And I'm sure that at the end of the day, they will also come over to the side. Many of them already are doing this. We see, we see gradual signs in the UN General Assembly, but we should do more. And the consequences, of course, uh, of the invasion, potential EU enlargement, potential NATO enlargement, you're still waiting for that final green light, Turkey, Hungary holding it up. Mm. Will you be a member, you think, by the big um, Vilnius NATO summit taking place in July? Well, we have high hopes for this, uh, not at least because already at the summit in Madrid last year, Sweden was accepted as an invitee by all, and I repeat this, by all 30 member states of NATO. We were publicly displayed as a state which was ready to join at any moment, and we know the support being shown by, by all the member states who are being asked for, 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 for support. Uh, they know that we will be a security provider, that we will bring well-equipped, well-trained troops to the table. We have a good Air Force, good Navy. We will enter the, Euro, the NATO with a 360-degree approach, as is, is, uh, is um, expected of us. It is true that we are still awaiting the ratification by both Turkey and of, of Hungary, but with Turkey, there is now an election underway, so we have to wait for that. 14th of May is the date set for the election, and after that we will know more. With Hungary, I will retaliate what I have said many times before. There is no special memorandum written with Hungary, as we did with Turkey, a memorandum where we have fulfilled all the uh, commitments that we undertook, and we will also now have new terrorist legislation entering into force on the 1st of June. It has been voted in the Swedish parliament. After that, there is nothing left. We have done everything. But with Hungary, we do not have a special memorandum. So the Hungarian parliament should move to the ratification as soon as possible. Okay, we shall certainly keep an eye on that. And regarding EU enlargement, I've seen the Czechs. The Czech foreign minister, in fact, is calling for EU member states to start negotiation talks already by the end of this year. Do you think that would be too soon? I think it, uh, it is a, in, an important thing to underline in every conversation that, yes, we are very much in favor of EU enlargement, um, as, both as a, a state, Sweden, but also as a presidency. Mm. We believe, however, that every enlargement, be it Ukraine, Moldova, or Georgia, all the countries of the Western Balkans, is a question about a merits-based process. Uh, because otherwise it is not credible in itself. So while I'm not saying that there should be a specific date uh, called upon, we do hope and expect the Commission to deliver a, a report on, for example, Ukraine, telling them how they have progressed. As I said in my speech, Ukraine has, despite of the war, of all the challenges and all the strains put on the administration and the public services of Ukraine, been able to make reform steps, important reform steps. And this also should be acknowledged. Okay. I'm just going to look around the room and see if there are any questions from the audience. I'd also just like to ask you, though, about migration and the migration asylum pact that's been sitting on the desks of EU member states for years that was presented back in 2020 by the European Commissioner for Migration, Ilva Johansson. Will you be able to solve this problem within the Swedish presidency? And how do you, how do you solve this? Yeah, yeah you, um, you speak to a person who for eight years was the uh, Minister of Migration in Sweden. So I've seen this file <laughs> when it was fairly new. 
the attempt of creating uh, common migration rules on a deeper, ever, a deeper scale than ever we have seen before. But um, I will not again be, you know, too, how should we say, go too much into details because this is after all a project where there are many players. We look with uh, pleasure with the fact uh, that the European Parliament voted in favour of the product, but now there will be a negotiation within the Council and we shall see what that will, uh, that will lead to, as is the case within the European Union. But migration is an important subject, not least in Italy, the country where we are now, the member state of the European Union. That goes without saying. And I have had many important conversations with my colleague, uh, the Foreign Minister of Italy, Antonio Tajani, who is also a good friend of mine since many years. I share the worries of the Italian government that we need to look towards the southern neighborhood, especially to Tunisia, and understand how much this means for the European Union. Now there is also, in addition to the already existing challenges with, with Tunisia, Sudan to be added. And we all know what has happened during the last, last uh, weeks. It could be that we will see, in, in retrospect, uh, for, for, for what is going on in Sudan, a regional uh, imbalance or destabilization uh, taking place. And we should keep a very close eye on this because it could have migratory consequences. Okay, I'll just take a look around the room. We have one question there. If you would just please introduce yourself and keep your question brief. Uh, Mr. Foreign Minister, I'm Ron Holtzacker from the University of Groningen in the Netherlands. In your opening remarks, you talked about Thailand. In December was the EU ASEAN summit in Brussels, and I wonder if you could talk a little bit more broadly about uh, developments in the EU ASEAN relationship and also the broader Southeast Asia, including Indonesia, for example. Thank you. Thank you for your question. Okay. Go ahead. Okay. Indeed, I would very much like to talk about it because uh, during the Swedish presidency, the uh, upcoming meeting uh, with the EU Indo-Pacific to be held in, in Stockholm uh, next week uh, on the back-to-back uh, -back with Gimnish, the other meeting of EU foreign ministers, is a very important meeting indeed. It will bring all the stakeholders, including ASEAN, together with the EU uh, foreign ministers, together for an intense discussion on our common values, our common challenges, and how EU and the Indo countries of the Indo-Pacific view the situation as we are now. We have many things in common, trade, security, questions related to climate change and green transition. There won't be a lack of topics to talk about, uh, to talk about the future, but that the Indo-Pacific and the EU should show more interest to one another, I think goes without saying. Okay, I think that is it from the audience. Just one final question from me, perhaps. Next uh, Tuesday is Europe Day. Will you be celebrating and will your Swedish compatriots be celebrating? Yes, we will. I have already prepared my speech and I know fairly well what I'm going to, to say about it. Um, we have uh, also uh, actually taken a, a decision in the Swedish Parliament to make the, uh, the uh, Day of Europe uh, a, a uh, day for, for public flagging to show how much we believe in the idea of the European Union in my country. And flag days are scarce in Sweden, I can say. Okay, on that note, we bring total wrap. So Tobias Bostrom, Minister of Foreign Affairs for Sweden, thank you so much. And best of luck with the remaining part of your Swedish presidency. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you very much. Thank you. Sweden will, of course, hand over to Spain uh, in July, and they will take over then for six more months, um, presiding over the European Union. Now, ladies and gentlemen, it's time to stick to the topic of foreign affairs, but broaden it out towards European security architecture in its entirety with this upcoming panel, which will focus on peace and conflict. We'll have various organizations up on stage from NATO as well. We'll have representatives and also from the OSCE. I believe that Eric Jones, the director of the Robert Schumann Center here at the University, European University Institute, will be moderating this panel. So let's just have a look and see, is Eric ready? Eric? Hello. Eric will be joined by Benedetta Berti, the head of policy planning from NATO. 
Christy Reich, the Deputy Director from the International Centre for Defence and Security, Natalie Tucci, the Director of the Instituto Affari Internazionali, and Tula Triuli, the Director of the OSE Conflict Prevention Centre. So, good to see you, Eric. How are you? Oh, it's, it, it's great to see you. Thank you great so much. Great to see you. Pleasure to be here. <laughs> Absolutely. So, over to you. Very excited to listen into your panel. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, <clears throat> look, I realize this has been a long day, and we've had a lot of conversation already, uh, but, but I think it's opportune for us to use these last moments of the State of the Union to begin anticipating what we're going to face in the future. And anticipating what we're going to face in the future, in particular in the context of the security architecture of Europe. Because we've been listening a lot to the imperative of war and to the need to support Ukraine. I think that was one of the most strongest statements that Josep Borrell made in his intervention this morning. And yet, supporting Ukraine and getting through this conflict is only the first step. And understanding where we go from there is going to be, if not challenging, um, then certainly urgent and important. And so I'm so grateful that we're joined today by four colleagues who represent the different dimensions of this security space. And what I'm going to do is ask them each a question and try to engage in conversation as we engage with one another, hopefully we'll bring you along in the debate and try to close out with a little question and answer at the end. Now, the first question is going to go to Benedetta Berti, who's joining us from NATO right now. Benedetta, we have heard a lot of statements today about the unity of the West, the unity of the transatlantic relationship, and the strength that that unity has to offer. I guess, I, I guess the question that I have, though, is how long can this unity last? And, and, and what do you think are the greatest threats that we are likely to face to the unity of the NATO alliance as we head into what may turn out to be an extended conflict? Right. Well, thank you. Thank you for the question, and it's, it's great to be here. Um, I think that's a really important question because, of course, uh, the, the imperative of maintaining our unity is absolutely crucial when it comes to uh, responding to Russia's war of aggression against Ukraine. So before I talk about what could go wrong, maybe it's good to start with what has gone right over the past year. I think if we would have, take, if we would have talked about transatlantic unity in response to Russian aggression before the war actually started, we would have doubted our resolve. I don't think many observers could have predicted our unity in terms of supporting Ukraine with military, financial and humanitarian assistance, our unity with imposing unprecedented sanctions on the Russian Federation to hinder its ability to wage war. So I think we need to start with recognizing that we have done a lot and we need to build on that, uh, on that unity and resolve. That said, there will be differences. There will be d internal discussions, and that's normal. We are, uh, the transatlantic community is made of different democracies. We will have different perceptions, but I think what's important to remember is that there is a strategic convergence on the basic bottom line, which is we need to make sure that one, Ukraine prevails as a sovereign independent state, and two, that this is the last war of aggression that the Russian Federation launches, and this puts an end to Putin's revisionist neo-imperialist designs. And I think there is convergence on these top objectives, and that gives me a lot of confidence when I look at the year ahead. I think it's also important that we, we message when we, when we think about unity and internal, and internal tensions that we are very clear in messages to the Kremlin. We are democracies. We will have internal discussions, but that does not mean that our will is faltering and we are continuing to support Ukraine for as long as it takes. Uh, if I may just say another, if I may add another point, the reason why I feel optimistic about our ability to maintain our unity is because I think we understand what is at stake here. And it's, first of all, of course, it's about Ukraine. It's about a sovereign, independent country's right to exist. We understand that. That's very important. But I think as Europeans and as a transatlantic community, we understand the stakes are much higher. 
if Putin prevails, if aggression is rewarded, it will not stop there. It means that our immediate, medium-term security environment will be more volatile, will be more insecure, that we will go back to a time of spheres of influence and nobody in Europe or in North America wants to do that. So I think as long as we keep the stakes in mind, we will maintain that unity. And that's especially important in a context of growing strategic competition, because what we do and how we handle uh, this war on our continent would also send very, very uh, clear signals to other authoritarian countries. Beijing is watching and is, and is going to be responding and adapting depending on whether we are actually able to do what we'd say and maintain our unity and continue to support Ukraine or not. So my point is, it won't be easy, but I think given that there is a strategic understanding of what is at stake and what happens if we fail, I think we will maintain that unity. So it's so interesting, Benedetta, that you, that you talk about this strategic understanding, and it's a strategic understanding that comes out of the conflict rather than going into the conflict. And Christy, I, I, I was wondering if I could, could tease out a bit from you what are the parallels that we're looking at here? Because if we weren't able to anticipate the unity that took place, as Benedetta said, that suggests that whatever kind of unity we had in the West before this conflict had somehow evaporated. Is there any continuity with our experience in the Cold War, or are we in a completely different paradigm for understanding how the West comes together and operates as a security community? Thank you for the question, and uh, also very happy to be here. Uh, Drawing parallels to the Cold War era is uh, indeed fascinating, I think, today. There are some similarities, there are some uh, differences. But thinking back uh, to the Cold War times, uh, at that time, of course, the UN-based uh, security order was already there. But what we don't speak about so often is that uh, large part of uh, Central and Eastern Europe uh, was area where this order was not actually valid. All the fine principles that were inscribed in the UN Charter did not uh, apply in, in many Central and Eastern European countries that were under Soviet control. And at that time, uh, Western countries developed uh, their own liberal rules-based order that was much uh, deeper than the UN system ever was. It was truly based on shared values and uh, shared institutions uh, that institutionalized uh, common norms and commitments through NATO and the EU, among others. And uh, these institutions were defending and protecting the democratic uh, systems in the West. So in that sense, we can draw parallels to the situation today. Now, uh, the border between Russia and the West has moved, of course, and uh, my country, among others, is now very glad to be on the right side of the border among the free and democratic uh, nations. Uh, but uh, quite like uh, during the Cold War, uh, NATO is, is back to this uh, historical task of uh, protecting uh, freedom and security and making sure that we have credible deterrence vis-a-vis -vis Russia that is aggressive and that is actually trying to re-establish the sphere of influence that it had during the Cold War. Then there are differences. Uh, we are no longer in a bipolar world. We are in something that looks more like a multipolar world uh, while the dominant uh, um, power rivalry is between uh, the US and uh, China and Europe is not at the center of the US-China competition which is again a difference uh, compared to the Cold War era um, and this is one of the reasons why it is so, um, so urgent for Europe to start doing more for its own security. We have been talking about it for so many years, and still what we see now during the war in Ukraine is how dependent Europe is still on the US. And this is something that cannot be uh, changed uh, quickly. 
Uh, NATO is still the main framework for European defense, there is no doubt about that. But within this transatlantic uh, framework, which uh, luckily has been strengthened uh, by the experience of having full-scale war back in Europe, within that framework, uh, we Europeans really now need to get our act uh, together and, and uh, uh, develop our defense capabilities and, and uh, our defense industrial base and, and uh, to be more, uh, more able to uh, take care of our defense in the future. So, Chrissy, this is such an important point, and it's not one that I've ever really thought about. I mean, the West now is a fundamentally different place from what the West was back in the Cold War because it includes so many more countries that used to exist in contested terrain. So if we were to go back, as Benedetta suggests, to a spheres of influence, that would involve what we call the West now actually ceding control or, or influence over a significant amount of territory, peoples, and, and economic resources. So, so there I understand your call for, for greater responsibility on the European side, greater industrial capacity. I guess my question, Natalie, though, is are we going to get any closer to this greater industrial capacity? I mean, Europe is certainly larger now, but does larger mean Europe is more able? I'm struck by a comment you made as we were preparing for this conversation about the way Europe is expending munitions and replacing munitions. We have a context or a conver conversation about strategic autonomy, but is that the direction in which we're headed? Mm. Well, l l let me start with the optimistic part of the story. Uh, and, and that is, it goes back to this point about unity that was being discussed. I mean, if we think of it, it's not particularly surprising that at the beginning of the war, there was a show of unity and solidarity. I mean, Russia's invasion was so brutal, so obscene, that in a sense, that was not, it was not that surprising. But I remember the debates back, you know, towards summer, beginning of the summer of last, uh, of last year, uh, where, you know, sort of, you started having these ideas of, you know, are, are there simmering divisions there that are beginning to surface? Is there a war fatigue that is going to kick in? Is there a peace versus justice camp that is beginning to emerge in the West? Are we going to face such a cold and expensive winter that that unity is going to crack? And here we are, several months on, and that hasn't happened. That unity still holds. To me, that is actually the really surprising, in a sense, part of the story. And of course, there's a reason why that has happened. And, and the reason is that, yes, we may have been lucky in different ways, but we have actually also delivered on policy. I mean, I think the energy piece of this, and then I'll come to, to defense, but the energy piece is really probably one of the most remarkable things that as Europeans, uh, you know, slightly less of a US story, but as Europeans, Europeans, we, we managed to do, and it wasn't at all obvious. Yes, we can say there was, you know, the weather and there was, you know, China messing up on COVID and all the rest of it, and yet the way in which we uh, diversified our sources, accelerated the energy uh, transition, coordinated our storage, uh, our gas storages, um, starting now to procure jointly, I mean, remember also that this is a competence that is still a national competence, largely speaking. So so this is actually quite remarkable, and had all of this not happened, then probably indeed those simmering divisions, which still exist, I mean, there are still, you know, sort of public opinion in, in, in Italy is very different from public opinion in Estonia, right? Um, so those divisions are there, but they're not materializing, they're not surfacing politically because we are getting the policy recipe relatively right. Now, that's the positive side of the story. Let me get to the more problematic one, which is indeed one about defense. And, and, I, I, and I say this um, not with any, um, actually, there's no criticism in what I'm going to say, because I actually think it's a genuinely almost impossible situation. So here we are, uh, having done, even when it comes to security and defense, as Europeans, really quite remarkable things. We've been talking about for years about the fact that we needed to spend more on defense and hey, here we are actually spending more on defense. Um, we have been uh, obviously providing military assistance to Ukraine and as the European Union, we have been doing it uh, 
with the European Peace Facility, again, an unprecedented move. Here we are now talking about procuring uh, ammunition and possibly even using EU funds to do this. I mean, this is a revolution. So I don't wish to in any way suggest that we're not doing enough. What I do, though, also observe is that European dependence, and this is really what our exchange was getting at, European dependence on the United States is also massively increasing. And this is simply because one thing is to spend in times of peace. When you spend, in when you spend more in times of peace, you basically spend to develop the European defense capacities of tomorrow. When you spend in times of war, you spend on refilling the stocks that are being emptied because you're rightly providing military assistance to a country at war. And so in a sense, if you're going to actually move towards greater autonomy rather than reverse, you not only need to spend more, you need to spend a lot, 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 lot more, right? And that is not happening. As I said, extremely difficult to even, to be, to be critical, forget it, but to even practically suggest what more could be done because I recognize that we are already doing a lot, but I simply observe the fact that the bottom line to all of this is a growing defense dependence on the United States, which is very different from what people like myself said for years. I mean, I always used to say, well, you know, we're going to spend more on defense and we're going to spend together and this is going to make us stronger and more autonomous, which was absolutely true, as I said, in times of peace. In times of war, it goes in the other direction. So it's interesting, you, you end up on this point that we need to spend an awful lot more, which echoes in many ways the point that Norbert Rut, uh, Rutgen said um, when he said, yes, Europe has come together and on the surface there's this unity, but beneath the surface there's a whole lot more effort that needs to be undertaken in order to, for this to be a success. And, and, and I see that in the, in, in the sort of physical terms, but I wonder if, if that's really the only response that we should be having. Because as I think about... Christie's point about the comparisons with the Cold War, there was another aspect to the Cold War that was hugely important, which was the elaboration of confidence and security building measures. And, and, and when I think about the point you made where you say, you know, we had to respond because of the brutal nature of Russia's invasion, you know, as an academic, my, my immediate thought is, oh, so if it wasn't so brutal, we wouldn't have responded. And then I go, oh yeah, in 2014, right, exactly. that's exactly what we did, exactly. right? You know, it was not so brutal. And we didn't, but we didn't respond in 2014 because we had this other set of instruments that we could deploy. And I wonder what the world looks like if those other sets of instruments, the confidence and security building measures, the dialogue, doesn't exist. So, Tula, I guess, my, I guess my question for you is, where is the role of the OSCE in this conversation? And, and how do we get back to a situation where we can imagine dialogue in a constructive sense? Thank you for that question. I don't know if I even can answer. It is a difficult one, but I think that uh, representing the OSC, first of all, I do have to say that, you know, I think we all know that pure military uh, power uh, is not going to resolve and, and bring to a conclusion. There will eventually need to be some kind of a political conclusion as well, and peace is a very, very complex matter. Um, the time is not right for that right now, that much we know. Um, I think that in terms of the, what the OSC can bring to the table, I mean, first of all, the time is also not right now, right, uh, for uh, even starting that discussion. I mean, I think yesterday we heard uh, even the prediction that there, is a, uh, there will be a permanent division between, uh, between the Russian Federation and, and, uh, and uh, then Europe or, or the West, whatever, let's call it the East and the West in this case. Um, but at the same time, I do believe that a, um, a forum for dialogue will be needed at some point. Um, and, and even now, it is, it is uh, you, you know, the OSC is still working. But I think geography will not change. So this is something. And, and that we may need to go back to um, not Helsinki 1975, which is when the Helsinki Final Act was signed, but to the process um, that took place before then, because it was actually, you know, at that time also, there was a lot of, I mean, it was definitely not a group of like-minded countries who, uh, who agreed on everything then, but rather it was a step-by-step -step process um, which, uh, which brought uh, 
at that time the CSCE, the Conference on Security and, and Cooperation in Europe, into being. And I think we might want to, want to look back into that. That doesn't mean dismantling what the OSCE is right now, but it means uh, that we need to first get to the point where there is enough good faith and readiness to engage in a discussion and, and, and to engage uh, at a point where one is trying to you know, move towards some kind of common ground. Um, the confidence and security building measures, which are the, the, the military side of, 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 uh, of the, what the OSC has, uh, they are unique tools. There is, you may have heard about the Vienna document and so forth. Um, I don't think their value has diminished, but, but we may need to uh, come to a point of really re-examining them and, um, and, and looking at whether we can pick up on some of those elements in, in those, you know, basically politically agreed uh, uh, confidence and security building measures and build something new, I'm saying eventually. And, and I think the one thing that we will always need to recognize is that uh, they are political tools. They're in that, you one could say, fair weather tools because you have to be willing to implement them, right? Everybody who has signed on has to be willing to use them. Otherwise, I mean, I think the one lesson we've learned, and I'll conclude what I say with that, is we've learned that, um, if we didn't know before, that uh, those confidence and security building measures are perfect for preventing escalation when it's an unwanted escalation. If somebody wants conflict, nobody's going to prevent it with those. So, and, uh, so Christy, I'm going to come back to you because there was something that Benedetta said and something that you said that come together in the context of this. You, you mentioned, Chrissy, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken, that Russia is trying to reassert its sphere of influence. Mm -hmm. And Benedetta said, we have a strategic consensus now that we should reduce Russia to such an extent that it can no longer undertake these kinds of wars of aggression. Um, and, and I guess my question is, if Russia is trying to assert its spheres of influence, what exactly do we have to do to Russia to prevent it from engaging in these kinds of wars of aggression. And if we do that to Russia, what is the likelihood that we're going to find ourselves in a situation where there's, what was the phrase, faith and readiness to engage in conversation with this Russia that we've just reduced? So I, I hate to put that on you, but since you, you're closest to Russia, except for our Finnish colleagues, so <clears throat> what, what else can we do? Uh, happy to, to try to answer. Thanks for the question. Um, I think in the Baltic states we saw it uh, for many years more clearly than uh, many other Western countries that uh, Russia did have its own understanding of how it wanted to build European security order, how it wanted to revise it, uh, and Russia's kind of deep dissatisfaction with the way the European security order was developing after the end of the Cold War became more and more visible uh, ever since uh, Putin came to power in 2000. So it didn't happen kind of overnight. And then we had this uh, common uh, security organization, the OSCE, which was kind of the main framework for trying to cooperate and uh, where we had uh, in principle some common norms established, but it's not really the fault of the OSCE that it uh, was not more helpful than that when you had uh, the situation where Russia was actually very determined to revise the European security order. And uh, today, Putin has not given up on this goal, which uh, Russia also very explicitly expressed in December 2021. Until then, maybe it was still a little bit uh, ambiguous uh, to some people what exactly Russia was aiming at. but. Uh, in the December 2021 documents, it became evident that it is indeed about restoration of uh, sphere of influence. And as long as um, we have this very fundamental disagreement between Russia and the West on, on how to define the basic principles of European security, I don't think uh, there is too much uh, space for, for dialogue and negotiation. It is very limited. We just have to be very persistent and uh, continue supporting Ukraine to make sure that Russia is defeated in Ukraine and that it will not expand its uh, imperialistic uh, uh, agenda to, to other parts of Europe. And then hopefully in the longer term, once uh, Russia 
has been defeated in Ukraine, this I expect will lead to some kind of uh, major internal upheaval inside Russia, some kind of change. This may take a long time before it will happen. It is also very much possible that uh, whoever will lead Russia after Putin will have a similar worldview, a similar understanding of Russia's imperialistic agenda. So things might not uh, change uh, quickly. But uh, after all, we have many post-imperial powers in Europe. So, so I'm kind of uh, trying to think uh, in the long term, uh, why could Russia not one day also become a post-imperial state? I really like this, this framing, Christy, about the idea that, that Russia was determined to revise the security, European security order and that, that this evolved into something much more confrontational over time. Um, but I have to admit, I'm, I find it worrying because isn't China also involved in a, in a sustained campaign to change the international security order, particularly in ways that, that, that go against what the United States would describe as its own national interest and certainly what the United States believes is in NATO's best interest as well. So, Benedetta, I'm going to push this back over to you. Do you see us on the same kind of collision course with China that we've had with Russia, this kind of slow boil that's slow until it's fast? And, 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 and by the way, if we achieve the goal that Christy just laid out in terms of Russia, a destabilization in the domestic level that leads to some kind of significant change, would that make our collision course with China worse? Or would it somehow take some of the pressure out of the relationship? Okay, so a very easy, easy question. I'll try to be as succinct as I can. Uh, I am very skeptical of anything that it's too deterministic. So I'm going to slightly push back and say, is, are, we gonna say are we gonna see the same movie play out? I do not know. Uh, but I, I do know what I see today is that the rules-based international order upon which our economies, our institutions, our democracies have, is, predicated, is predicated upon, that rules-based international order is under significant pressure. There is an authoritarian pushback against that order. It is deliberate. It is done both within uh, international institutions to hollow them out and without to try to seek an alternative. And the, Russia and China are at the forefront of that authoritarian pushback. That I can say. So there's definitely something for those who value the rules-based international order, that's, an, that's certainly something we should be worried about. There is a systemic competition, which is one of the most transformative trends in the global, in the global international system. So that's also playing out. Uh, and we do, and, while, and it, while from a NATO perspective, China is not a military adversary, China is not an adversary, it is however seen as a strategic competitor, which means we are seeing what the PRC is doing in terms of military modernizations without transparency or clarity about its purpose. We're seeing what it's doing in terms of uh, deliberate investments in critical infrastructure to create dependencies. We see the cyber and hybrid threats. We see all of that, and I think the conclusion is there is a challenge. It is a systemic one. It is one that requires our attention. It is one that has implications both for Euro-Atlantic security, but also for the broader rules-based international order, and that's why it's so important to work towards transatlantic convergence on how to deal with that challenge. Adding to the list of problematic behavior, I would say that over the last year, we have seen how Beijing has supported Moscow uh, with everything but lethal, uh, but lethal equipment. It has amplified uh, Russia's false narratives with respect to the war in Ukraine. Uh, it has, before the beginning of the war, uh, signed a no limits partnerships where essentially it validated Russia's view of going back in time when it comes to the European security order. All of those, all of those actions are problematic, I think, from a, from a transatlantic point of view. Of course, the call to China is to act like a responsible member of the international community, and that would require them to use their influence on Moscow to stop this, this war of aggression. But 
as of today, that's not what I'm seeing. So I'm not saying that it's the same movie that's going to repeat itself in another theater, but I, I would say we need to be prepared to deal with a security environment that is more volatile, more contested, more competitive, and when the two main theaters of confrontation, the Euro-Atlantic and the Indo-Pacific, are more and more related. And that's all very difficult to do, um, but I think that's the reality we face. So, Natalie, the, the, <clears throat> Benedetta has just talked about the need for some kind of transatlantic convergence in its positioning toward, toward China. Um, and you've already mentioned this growing dependence on the United States in terms of military procurement. If we get that kind of convergence, what room is left for strategic autonomy in Europe? And, and, and by the way, the, unrelated, but the Chinese are looking at this situation and saying that the real threat to the rule-based system is the call for friend shoring and strategic convergence by the United States. So, so how do we explain to China, if there is this convergence, that we're not doing it basically to isolate them mm. in the global system? Well, I think you sort of beginning with the first part of, uh, of your question, where does it leave strategic autonomy? I mean, I think the fact that there is, if there is convergence, the fact that there is convergence in and of itself does not necessarily signal the fact that this is not the product of an autonomous European position. And actually, you know, sort of when it comes to China, I think regardless of the United States, and then I'll come to the, the link with the United States, but regardless of the United States, I think that beginning in 2016, 17, but then especially since COVID, there has been a progressive hardening of European views vis-a-vis -vis China. Um, it's a little bit like the trajectory that we had on Russia, uh, but of course in Russia it kind of started earlier and then it sort of obviously all came, you know, to a crux with, with, uh, with its invasion of, of Ukraine. With China, of course, it started later and it's more slow moving, but I think it's moving in the same direction. Now, does that mean that the European position is the same as that of the United States? No, it does not. And what is the difference? In many respects, it's encapsulated by the difference between what decoupling and de-risking is all about. I think in the case of the United States, um, let's say, let's assume for the sake of argument, and I realize it's um, somewhat far-fetched, but let's assume that China becomes a wonderful liberal democracy, but it's growing and it's overtaking the United States. Would Europe have a problem with that? No, it wouldn't. Would the United States have a problem with it? Yes, it would. So for Europe, the China question is a question of protection. We have a problem with China because of the nature of its political system and the way in which it interferes in our own, be it through economic uh, uh, instruments, be it through disinformation, be it, you know, but it's, it's a direct consequence of the nature of its political system. In the case of the United States, there's that, but actually far more important, there is this question of competition. Europeans don't have any kind of ambition for global hegemony. I mean, we've kind of done that, lost it, it's not going to come back. So there is a difference. You know, when Europeans talk about de-risking, it is about protection, essentially. Now, what worries me, and it comes to this point about autonomy or, or lack of it, is that because of that growing dependence on the United States, Europeans will not be autonomous in determining what they actually think and would, would like to do vis-a-vis -vis, uh, China. Because there is inevitably going to be a payback that the United States will ask for uh, because of what it has done essentially to, you know, for, for European security. Now, that to me is a source of concern as a believer in transatlantic relations because I actually think that a healthy transatlantic relationship in a world which is not uh, sort of in a broader international system that is not shaped by sort of a unipolar US-led order, but that inevitably is far more multi or non-polar, uh, in, in that kind of world that we're already in, a healthy transatlantic relationship is a more equal one, is a more balanced one, and that growing dependence on the United States reduces the possibility for that more equal partnership, including vis-a-vis, -vis, uh, and especially I would say vis-a-vis China. So this notion of, of a more balanced transatlantic relationship is obviously very, very appealing in many respects, particularly when you imagine a, a change in U.S. administrations where the United States 
decides to retreat somewhat from the responsibilities of global leadership or, or what you referred to as, as global hegemony. I guess the, the, the question that I have though is, is it does sound as I listen to you talk, if we're going to have this convergence and on the one hand Europe and the United States are, are, are coming together, albeit slight differences, and on the other hand you have China and Russia, that we are moving toward a spheres of influence. And, and, and Tula, I guess the question I have for you is, you know, we focus a lot on the conflict in Ukraine, but the possibility for conflict in other parts of the world to emerge as a result of this convergence in competing worldviews, how are we going to manage that? Because, correct me if I'm wrong, but the OSCE is not just engaged in Ukraine, right? I mean, you are engaged in many places, and all of those places are potential hotbeds for the reemergence of violent conflict that has so far been relatively successfully managed. In, indeed. Can you give me an hour and I will talk about this? <laughs> no, I, joking. Jokes aside, don't worry. Um, no, I think uh, one thing that I was thinking about was that, um, that right now we're in a situation, well, no, not right now. We've been in a situation for a while already, but it is affecting us that, you know, there, is the, there are two kinds of diff different uh, perceptions of what multilateralism is about. It's... Um, you know, power-based or then uh, rules-based, international, you know, rules-based or order. And so I think there, that's where we get to then the question of how do we manage that situation? And um, I think that one thing to manage there is, is that, and what we're worried about is the erosion of arms control mechanisms, because those are obviously something that are not, not just relevant right now to the war uh, that we are witnessing. And, and this erosion was already taking place long before uh, February 2022. So I think uh, the, the worry there overall is that uh, while these this arms control regimes and regime is, is the European ar arms uh, security architecture, the erosion of that means that there is also a dismantling of a culture of transparency and openness um, about intentions in military in the military sphere and 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 this is something where then we need to see again i 'm coming back to saying. We don't know when, we don't know how and at which point, but, um, and it's premature yet to think about that, but how to start rebuilding uh, that architecture of, of, of arms control so that we can sort of start returning back to the transparency and so forth, and how to bolster that framework. And, and uh, that's something that's, uh, that's a much longer discussion, but, but that I think is something that we need to really take seriously and look into the longer term over this war. So we have, um, we have about 12 minutes for questions from the audience, um, but I, wanted, I do want to summarize where I think we are in terms of our European security architecture. And, in, and within that European security architecture, we have a robust NATO alliance, and that robust NATO alliance has a very strong strategic conception that's different from what it had during the Cold War, and in many respects, much more ambitious than what it had during the Cold War, because the idea of dismantling the Soviet Union was not something that anybody ever considered. And let's not forget, the nuclear status of Russia has not changed in the intervening period. So we're more ambitious in a high-risk context. Uh, and, and yet that strategic convergence is, is underpinned by dramatic levels of dependence across the Atlantic, and by, by little in the form of support from a multilateral arrangement that helped to suppress conflict that emerged. Go ahead. Then. No, just very quickly, because I, I think I need to just respond to that, to that. I think that you're correct that NATO is the cornerstone of the European, uh, of, the, of how you defend Europe, and as it has been for, for 70 plus years. And I think you're right that it is more ambitious because the security, require, er, the, the security environment requires it to be so. I would not say that we are more ambitious in terms of how we're managing the Russia threat. Our policy is very clear. It's about deterrence and defense. It's about maintaining channels of communication open to avoid unintended escalation. It's about building up our own resilience against malign interference. And it's about supporting Ukraine so that it can exercise its right to self-defense. It is not, NATO is not 
at war with Russia and has no intention or no desire to do so and has definitely no policy on what happens domestically in Russia. This is about preventing aggression and defending every inch of allied territory. I'm not saying that's what you were saying, but just in case, I felt I had to, to say that. <laughs> I, I, I think, Benedetta, I think the precision is, is well warranted, but, but Chrissy, please correct me if I'm wrong. I mean, my, my understanding was that this is really about reducing, degrading Russia's military capacity to a significant extent, so much so, in fact, that you suggested that this would create a change in the domestic political order at the same time. That was Christy, yeah. Not NATO. Let, let, let me comment and specify what I meant. I do not share the view, although it has been made by, by some uh, commentators from our region, that um, NATO or Western countries should actually aim at actively pushing for some kind of change in Russia. This is something I think we have to leave to the Russians themselves. Our focus needs to be on helping Ukraine win the war, yep making sure that uh, we are able to defend ourselves, that we are able to put up a credible deterrence so that Russia would not make another misjudgment, like it uh, made a terrible misjudgment in the case of Ukraine and we went to war with the expectation that it could have a quick victory. Yeah. We have to make very sure that Russia could not make a similar misjudgment uh, with regard to attacking uh, any NATO country. So that's why we need deterrence. Yeah. But when I say that uh, I expect Russia's military defeat in Ukraine to lead at some point to domestic changes within Russia, this is not something that we should be proactively pushing for, but it will be a consequence of Russia experiencing a defeat of its imperialistic agenda, which will, I think, force Russia to think about what kind of model of development mm. it actually wants to pursue in the 21st century. Does it make any sense to stick to the old uh, imperial agenda when it is not successful and it is not serving the interests of the Russian state or the, or the Russian people? Yeah, I know I'm supposed to go to questions, but Tula, I have to bring you in on this because I'm, 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 a, little bit, I'm a little bit confused. I, I understand exactly what you're saying, and I, I, I like the, the diplomatic phrasing, but let's not forget, Russia has a mercenary army that is deployed across North Africa and into the Sahel and in the Middle East. So, so it's not just a question of a development model, it's a foreign policy model, it seems to me, yeah. that needs to be amended tool. Do, do we have any instrument? I mean, it sounds like from what you were saying, that situation is going to get worse and not better with the lack of transparency and the, the degradation of our arms control regimes. Well, two things maybe quickly. I mean, first of all, of course, the OSC region has seven, uh, 57 participating states, which means that we work on that area. So when you mention Sahel or something else that goes beyond my, uh, my mandate, but I think there is definitely, that's exactly why we need to go back to looking at the arms control regime, even for the fact that there are all these other new things, emer I think that we've become more aware of with the war now, I mean, hybrid threats, right? But I mean, things like that, we will need to really, um, you know, look into all these, these, whether it's AI, whether it's autonomous systems, whether it's, it's drones, all these other things as well. So I think we really have a challenge there. And of course, I would imagine that what we decide within the OSCE region and, and if the countries in the OSCE, including Russia, would um, you know, follow those principles, then that would also be positively affecting the rest of the world. But then I think I just want to say one more thing, which is that I think we need, when we think about European security architecture and European security, let's not forget, it's really not just about military security. We're seeing everything that is happening right now in Ukraine. I mean, starting from environmental degradation, I'm not going to start going into a list, but security is like so much more than just the military part of it. And this is what we're going to be living in, living with for decades to come. Okay, Natalie, since, since I've asked everybody else an extra question, I'm going to come back to you. Tula makes this point about European security being so much more than just military security, and that reminds me of the comment that you started out with, where you said, you know, look at all that Europe has been able to accomplish in the context of this conflict in the areas of energy and all the rest. 
But look at all the issues that Europe still has to deal with, one of which is obviously migration, and another is facilitating climate adaptation in, in other parts of the world, particularly in sub-Saharan Africa, where the migration pressure is coming from. To what extent do you think Europe is ready to tackle those challenges in addition to this huge agenda? Because that must be a critical piece of the security architecture. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I think that whereas, again, just to give a kind of, you know, the, the, the positive and the negative here, whereas I think um, looking east, not only are we doing as much as we can, uh, and perhaps it's not enough, as, you know, we were discussing in the defense area, but, but it's like really trying, right? <laughs> um, and I think the other point, which I think is worth highlighting again, uh, going east is that um, enlargement is back. You know, enlargement, we had forgotten about enlargement, you know, sort of since basically 2007. I mean, yes, Croatia came in 2013, but the truth is that enlargement was a kind of deadish process. And now enlargement is back with, with a vengeance. Hooray. Uh, there is no gray zone that is stable in between uh, the European Union slash NATO and, and Russia. And, and now we know that. Uh, so that's the, the good news. I don't necessarily mean that we're going to deliver on it, but we understand <laughs> the strategic imperative of enlargement in a way in which we'd forgotten about. Now, where I'm extremely uh, sort of pessimistic and worried is indeed looking south. Um, I think that at the moment we're in a sense in a world in which we've, although, and the Wagner point, you know, sort of highlights it, although actually we know that there is no division between east and south mm -hmm. because Russia is south. Mm -hmm. um, Actually, we, we are still victim of our old instincts. So at the moment, basically North and East European countries are not really thinking about the South. Southern European countries think about the South in the wrong way. And they think about the South in the wrong way because they are so migration obsessed. I mean, look at my own country. The, if you think about what's the approach towards Tunisia, just give it all the money and forget about the conditions, right? Because of the pure terror of an authoritarian state that actually advocates ethnic cleansing. So this is kind of, you know, <laughs> the, the real paradox of it. Uh, because of the sheer terror that it will collapse and what are the migration consequences of that regime collapsing. So basically you have negligence to the north and east and attention in the wrong way to the south. Um, and indeed it's on that political human rights front, but equally so on a, a set of other issues. Just to kind of end on the point that you were highlighting, we're single-handedly focused on, when we think of the South, energy security. Great, fantastic. Are we paying as much attention to accelerating the energy transition in these countries? Because again, take another example from the South. Italy has been largely saved by Algeria. Fantastic. What's going to happen the minute in which we're going to stop buying that gas? Because we will have decarbonized. What are the security implications for a country like Algeria or Nigeria? And the list goes on and on. Okay, so I think, I, I think at this point I have to bring our conversation to a close. Uh, I've, I've been given the end signal even though it's, there's still time left on the clock. Uh, having said that, I, I, I'm, I'm less clear, I think, on the European security architecture than I am on the research agenda that we will have to pursue because the range of challenges that you guys have put before us is dramatic. And I hope everyone in the audience will join me in thanking you for what was indeed a fascinating conversation. So thank you all. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you so much, Eric Jones, and to your esteemed all-female panel. Delightful to see you all. Thank you so much. Fascinating discussion. Hopefully we'll see you later. Because now, ladies and gentlemen, unfortunately, the State of the Union Conference 2023 is almost coming to an end. We just have one session left. And that session will take stock of the state of the current European economy. And who better to do that with than the European Commissioner in charge of the economy, the European Commissioner from Italy, that's Paolo Gentiloni. Yesterday, he was in Brussels speaking at the Brussels Economic Forum. And today, he's with us physically present here in Florence at the Palazzo Vecchi. And this session will be moderated by Suzanne Lynch, that's Politico's chief Europe correspondent and host of EU Confidential,
podcast. So let's just take a look if Suzanne Lynch is ready to come on stage. She is. So round of applause, ladies and gentlemen, for Suzanne Lynch and for Commissioner Gentiloni. Thank you. Enjoy. I, quit, I think you're, you're over there. Thank you very much uh, for joining us for what is the final session of the afternoon. And again, I have the privilege of closing yesterday's session and closing today's session, and again in a magnificent uh, room like we are here now. So, uh, real privilege uh, to be having this vista in front of us. But uh, we're on to more serious matters now of state, and I'm delighted to be joined by Commissioner Paolo Gentiloni who is the EU Commissioner for Economy since 2019 and also very well known to many of you in the audience uh, here in Florence, Italy. So Commissioner, thank you uh, for joining us for this final panel. I'm going to start off with a question that Maeve actually posed in the first session of today with uh, Joseph Barrell, which is she asked him about the past year for the EU in terms of security and defence policy. What's your views on, on the last year for the European economy? How are you feeling uh, about it at this stage when you're on? Uh, well, eh, buongiorno. Um, eh, good, good afternoon, buonasera. Uh, so happy to be here. Um, indeed, I would say that for the European economy, the three and a half years that we have behind us were... Uh, defining moments. Um, of course, the, the fact that we had to face uh, two uh, crises in a row, two, two black swan, the, the pandemic, the economic consequences of the pandemic. Uh, now, we, maybe we don't remember very well how deep was the crisis at the time. Uh, around Easter 2020, we reached minus 20% of GDP in the European Union. And then the energy crisis, the war, what uh, happened uh, in more recent times, inflation, uh, tightening of monetary policy, etc. Overall, if I have to give you a short answer, I think that um, the European Union uh, took unprecedented decision, and so these three and a half, and a half year were um, a, a big, big change for the European Union. Then will we be able to keep this big change going in the coming months and years? Here is the big question. But for sure these moments you know how many words were used, the Hamiltonian moment, the Rubiconian moment, the Copernican moment, whatever. But the fact is that it was really a, an extraordinary uh, period of changes. I mean, as you say there, one of those changes was this decision to issue this common debt, a, you know, a, re a really big change. Um, another change that has emerged in the field of Eurozone and European economic management is these proposed changes to the fiscal rules, the kind of rule book, the, the stability and growth pact has kind of been the Bible of EU eco economic policy for so long. And there has always been political divisions about this. It's a very tricky topic. We've got some countries who believe it should be stricter, some who believe that it needs to, to loosen up a bit. Now, you've come forward with your proposals um, with a change, uh, but how confident are you that these are going to get through? We've got some big players, and I'm thinking of one big country, Germany, who is not entirely happy. I mean, are you confident the proposal you have put forward is, is going to pass muster? Well, I have to be confident. Uh, it's my job, so I'm confident by, by definition. Um, is it all only my job? the fact that I, I have to be confident? I don't think so. Indeed, I think we uh, put on the table a very good uh, reform proposal. Well, I'm selling my, my wine, so it's difficult to, to tell the opposite. Uh, but also a balanced proposal. 
with a very clear target of reducing the debt in a more gradual and realistic way and uh, have incentives for growth, sustainable growth investments in a stronger way. Um, I think the, the awareness in the club uh, of member states of the need to change these rules is very strong. Uh, the supporters of keeping the situa situation as it is are quite few, and maybe no one. Everyone recognizes the fact that the existing rules for uh, reducing the debt are non-realistic. Second thing that I should note um, is that the level of uh, controversy this is one of the more controversial files in the European Union since ever. Yeah, it's, it's a big deal. Uh, the, the frugals, the, the pigs, the, the club mad, uh, all the definitions of previous years. What I'm seeing now is a l less entrenched uh, conversation uh, and what it is interesting to note from my point of view is that one of the starting points for the reform that then we proposed came uh, by a non paper of uh, two European countries, uh, Spain and the Netherlands, that normally yeah. were in these two camps fighting each other. Now, uh, these two finance ministers, uh, Nadia and Sigrid, made an excellent non-paper in my view. And this is not only to uh, appreciate their role, but to say that the discussion is more fluid less entrenched than it was. So yeah. I'm confident we will reach an agreement. I mean, it's a very interesting point you may make about those, that big division that dominated European economic policy for a decade. Do you think as well, I mean, we're talking about the state of the union, if we step back and kind of assess kind of the state of the European Union now in terms of economic policy, things have changed so much in a decade. I mean, a decade ago, austerity was all the rage. It was all about, you know, fiscal prudence. We saw what happened in Greece, uh, to an extent in my own country, Ireland, those countries that had to take bailouts. Has there been a, comp there's been a real change in economic orthodoxy now, it seems. Now, I know it's more complex than that, but countries have kind of, do you think there's been a reassessment that that wasn't the right way to do things? Well, I think the world has changed. And to repropose now austerity would be uh, impossible. Mm. What happened after the great financial crisis? I think, well, we have fiscal rules, very good. Part of these fiscal rules, especially, you know, we have a, you, we have a ceiling for the deficit, which is at 3%, uh, where may be useful uh, to signal to member states that they need to have a prudent fiscal policy. But overall, what happened was that the debt increased, despite our rules were <laughs> for decreasing it very severely, and uh, investments decreased. Year by year after the great financial crisis, we had lower level yeah. of investments. Can we now repeat this experience with the investment needs that we are ahead of us, a mountain? of investments, can we have again declining investment and increasing debt? I think it's crucial in the new attitude about fiscal rules, which is not the fact that we are there with an agreement, but that we can work to have a good agreement, is the awareness that reproposing austerity is impossible and that we need to have signals that the debt is in the right trajectory and in the same time we need incentives for investments. Can we do this? Of course, yes, with our proposal.
Well, that brings me to another big theme, I think, of the last year or so in Europe, which has been the idea of, we were talking yesterday about strategic autonomy, but also in the economic field, the need for Europe to uh, be more, uh, be less dependent on other nations, to, to bolster its own industrial capacity, its own innovation, those kind of things. And we've seen these, this, this real tension. It's been a, it's something of a, of a renaissance in EU-US relations, but there have been moments of tensions, and one of those was the Biden administration's decision to introduce this Inflation Reduction Act, which itself was a very, very ambitious investment program and, and very um, very progressive in terms of what it's doing in climate, but it had unintended consequences, one of which was that it very much annoyed Europe and the EU for some of the subsidies that it saw were anti-competitive and protectionist. Now, the European Union is coming up with its own uh, ideas about how to strengthen and bolster and repair the EU economy. I mean, do you think Europe has the means to do this? Do you think it has the political will to do this? And will it work? Uh, well, first, uh, I think a, a, a revolution happened in Brussels um, because when we mention uh, strategic autonomy, well, indeed, in de facto, the real definition is open strategic autonomy. Mm -hmm. And this is telling the yeah. fact that we have these three words uh, because open strategic autonomy reflects the fact that this is, in a certain sense, a revolution, but without cancelling uh, the basis of our single market based on competition, based on openness, etc. But at the same time, the revolution is that industrial policies, common policies, are now flagship for the European Union. Mm. Uh, there is no discussion about this. How can we have our role in this global industrial race for clean technologies, uh, which is going on uh, among the big economic players in the world? There is a new industrial race for clean technologies. Can Europe be out of this race, only saying, OK, we have a good single market ruled by competition, by our state trade rules, and we go. This is impossible, and I think the awareness of this is very clear. And it's a big, big, big change for the European Union. At the same time, this change is requesting further changes. Because this change is a change in attitude, is a change in big targets that we are giving us with member states. It can be a change, significant change in regulation. But is this sufficient? How do we participate to this global race? Only loosening state aid rules? and giving each member state the possibility to subsidize their own businesses? Or will we have also a European common dimension in this task? Of course, I am fully convinced that we need also this second part of this task. And by the way, President von der Leyen was mentioning this when she referred to a sort of sovereignty fund mm. Uh, for the European Union. Do you think we're going to see that soon, the sovereignty fund? Well, depends on what you mean by soon. <laughs> we're, we're wondering, because there's been lots of talk about it, but uh, do you expect it this summer? I think it's quite clear that we need it. Uh, we can't participate to this uh, global industrial race only having 27 different ways of subsidizing uh, businesses. Uh, we need at least to unite our forces to support uh, common projects that need European scale and that have a clear European added value. Someone could say, okay, but you already have a lot of money with the uh, recovery 
and resilience facility. They are also targeted for the clean technologies, which is true. But at the same time, we know that these resources were distributed country by country. There was an allocation key, and all the money uh, went to single member states. And I think in the conditions we were in reacting to the pandemic, it was the right thing to do. Mm. But now, can we only rely on member state initiative, or do we need also a second leg, so to say, which is a European response? Definitely, I think we need it. And we will discuss this with the budget of the Union in the coming weeks and months. I think if we introduce this, even not with enormous amount of money, uh, this will represent a big change for the Union. Um, speaking of individual countries, now I know EU commissioners leave their national hat at the door when they enter the Berlin Mountain Brussels, but Italy, your home country, um, it has been in negotiations effectively with the Commission, with your department, about its access to billions of euro in recovery funds. Italy got by far the biggest allocation of those funds, but there has been delays with this. I mean, are you concerned now that Italy seems to be unable to draw down the full amount? Um, lots of delays, uh, seems to be somebody, we made, made the point recently reporting on this that some people said, is it too much money to spend? So, are you concerned? Well, let, let me say three things. First, yes, indeed, Italy uh, received a lot of this uh, common package. At the same time, if we relate the amount of money to GDP, there are several countries that, in relative terms, okay. have more money than Italy. Okay. Uh, second, so far, no delays. Um, yes, there, there are some few weeks uh, technical delay in the third uh, disbursement request, but this has been the case also for other, other countries in the recent uh, months. Having said this, I think Everyone should be aware, and I know that the Italian authorities are aware, of how challenging is the further um, commitment on further um, targets, milestones, you know that all the programs are defined on very mm. specific targets and milestones because we know the difficulty in Italy, as in other countries, of absorption of European money. What I can say it is that I see the awareness of this difficulty in the Italian authorities. Uh, I see a lot of good cooperation, uh, Brussels, Rome, on this. But this is, uh, should be, in my view, the main concern of the Italian authorities in the economic field. Because yes, we have a good, good, a sufficient level of growth. We had a first quarter in Italy at 0.5% of growth, which is not bad. So we have a carryover growth uh, for, for the year, which is decent. But without growth, without sustainable growth, we will not be able to do the two things I was mentioning before. First, putting the debts in a declining trajectory, and at the same time, investing on uh, modernization, green transition, social resilience, etc. We need growth. And if we have such a big amount of uh, European common resources at our disposal, we have to transform this in our main, main priority. Mm. The awareness is there, but this is the possible game changer for the Italian economy. Okay, so strong message there. Before we get to a couple of questions, it's finally, you know, the war in Ukraine has been such a defining moment for Europe in terms of 
foreign policy in particular and defence, but also the economy. We've, you know, it's contributed to inflation, obviously. Um, although we did see a, a, a slowdown in, in core inflation in the recent figures that were out this week of the eurozone. Um, I mean, do you agree with, for example, the EU budget? I mean, we mentioned there there's going to be discussions about the budget now coming up, but the EU budget being used for defence, for example, do you, do you think that's a good thing or should it be used? Well, I think there are two very clear things. First, we have to uh, respect our treaties. Uh, and second, we have to strengthen uh, within the framework of the strategic autonomy our common defence. Uh, can these two things go together? Yes, they can. Okay. And on Ukraine and the, the kind of financial implications for Ukraine itself, huge reconstruction challenge is looming in Ukraine. I mean, how much do you think the EU can help on that? How much of a priority is this next phase in uh, the Ukraine challenge, that reconstruction cost? Well, of course, it's always um, difficult to have this, com this parallel conversation, yeah. now the conversation on the war and the conversation on reconstruction. But I very much appreciate the fact that the Ukrainians want, want that. to Absolutely. have this parallel conversation. Yeah. And we um, organized, as you know, this uh, coordination platform, um, technical um, uh, secretariat uh, being uh, both in Brussels and in Kyiv um, to try to coordinate donors in view of the reconstruction. Of course, reconstruction need two things. First, a Ukrainian uh, view and leadership. And second, a lot of private investments. We can't imagine to have a reconstruction only based on uh, public funding and the possible use, which is very controversial, of part of the 325 billion of freezed assets, uh, putting together yeah. the bank and uh, the, the private assets uh, that are freezed. But the use of this is very complex. Complex, controversial. Do you especially think it should be used? Do you think they should be used? Well, I think it should be addressed, but I'm not sure that the solution is easy. Okay, okay. Thank you very much. Just time for a couple of questions uh, to finish off our session. Yes, gentlemen down here on the right. Thank you. Oh, sorry. Uh, good afternoon, Jakub Gorzkowski. I have a question regarding the Next Generation EU fund. Uh, the tasks for the fund have been changing uh, recently. It is no longer uh, solely a post-pandemic or anti-pandemic instrument. We have uh, Repower EU uh, as a new chapter embedded into RRF as well, financed partly from this uh, money. But the deadline for spending uh, this money has not changed. It's still 2026. So I would like to ask you, Commissioner, uh, do you think it would make sense uh, to postpone this deadline to give some more flexibility for member states and companies to use this money as the uh, tasks, uh, how this money can be spent are changing? Thank you. Well, first, it is um, in the common interest of member states and of the European Commission to spend this money. I, I, I would avoid to, to divide in two different camps member states that are interested in spending this money and the Euro European Commission, which is neutral on this. Because we know very well that uh, the Rubicon, Copernicus or Hamilton or whatever will materialize if this thing works. If it doesn't work, we have a problem. So we have a common interest in spending money, but at the same time we have rules, regulations that are very clearly defining the deadline at 2026. So, well, legal tweaks are always possible, uh, and the fantasy for legal tweakings 
my former head of cabinet, uh, Marco Buti, could give us a lesson <laughs> on uh, how the Brussels machine is flexible in, in many ways, but there are some points that are very difficult to, uh, uh, to, to avoid because they are very clearly defined. Yeah, yeah, interesting. Any, one last question here, second row, thank you. Uh, hello, good afternoon. My name is Juraj Pala. I'm the researcher here at the EUI. And I think it's interesting that you kind of uh, show this uh, evolution of the EU that we shifted to a certain interventionist model maybe since 2010 and we started with bailing out the, the countries or the banks of the, of the EU. During the COVID, we bailed out the, the businesses because they were in danger this pandemic. But I'm wondering, we saw during the last decades the constant growth uh, and, and, as, and profits also rising of the, the biggest companies during the COVID as during the current Ukraine war. And I'm wondering is, uh, is how we make sure that the growth that is coming won't, uh, will go to the people or the work, working people and will decrease the inequalities, the social inequalities that are still rising. So how to make sure that this growth will be distributed more justly in the European Union and not concentrated as it is currently? Uh, well, difficult uh, answer because, well, the, the, the official answer uh, based in our traditional, uh, you know, we have always uh, lines to take. Oh, no? I know. <laughs> uh, lines to take is that, yes, we have the Just Transition Fund. We have, we have a lot of measures that are uh, going in the direction you were mentioning. I think we were right in preserving uh, jobs during the uh, pandemic. Um, through our schemes supporting job, uh, we supported 50 million workers during the pandemic. So huge numbers. And this sure mechanism is something I'm very proud of because, of course, we all refer to next generation EU, but this sure mechanism was the first decision taken uh, in uh, Good, Fra good uh, Thursday 2020, and it was good. Uh, now there is a lot of conversation on um, windfall profits, uh, the possibility to observe them. I know that some member states are um, institu are creating observatories of uh, extra profits to find ways to work with this. But indeed, this is a target that we should have in common, member states and the European Commission. You know that the European Commission is not imposing taxes. Um, we have a form of um, solidarity contribution uh, in relation to windfall profits during the energy crisis, but it is not um, by chance that we called it solidarity contribution. It's not a tax. Um, so we are not imposing taxes, but for sure we see the risk of this crisis increasing the uh, social divergences and not decreasing them. So. We have several tools, a lot of money, for example, for the social dimension of the green transition, but we need also the political will and commitment from member states and from the public opinion in member states to keep this target very clear ahead of us. Mm, yeah, and of course, the, the cost of living crisis is something we didn't mention, but you know, as yeah. we know, a huge... And purchasing power loss are clear. All of that, that there are some of the issues uh, facing uh, the citizens of the European Union uh, at the moment. Commissioner, thank you very much for Grazie. your thoughts, and uh, thank you for closing out uh, the session. Grazie mille. Thank you. Thank you so much. Grazie mille. Thank you. Enjoy your weekend. Enjoy Thank your rest you. of your stay here in Florence. Suzanne Lynch, thank you so Thank much you. for that.
And thank you to our audience for your attention and, of course, for your questions. And to all those online who've been following, thank you so much. You can watch back all the editions, all the sessions today online and, of course, the previous editions. This, I'm afraid, ladies and gentlemen, brings uh, the SOTU 2023 to an end already. I feel like it flew by, but it was an amazing event with fantastic speakers. So I'm so glad that we could ha make it happen. And this afternoon, in a couple of minutes, in fact, for those in the room who speak Italian, the State of the Union for you will take place. It will be in Italian, and tonight at 8 o'clock, everyone's welcome to a performance that will take place up here on stage called Waiting for the Citizens. It's a play, and it's brought to you by uh, the School of Transnational Governments, by the students of Professor Calippo. There'll also tonight be the Erasmus Plus Orchestra. So if you're in Florence, do come back for that. And I wish you all a wonderful rest of the day. And thank you so much. You were a great audience. Bye-bye. See you soon. I come from a lot of practical experiences uh, related to these issues. And I thought it's time for me to take some time off to analyze the policies and look at the gaps and see how we can better campaign for change. It's always uh, interesting to meet people from other parts of the world because these are different cultures meeting, interacting, and this is an experience you cannot buy. Academia is great because it helps us to, to, to find concepts to share or ideas, but practice is fundamental in peace building especially because it's something that you have to do day by day. It's not just a set of techniques, it's also a philosophy that you need to start applying. Um, I think I was also very much attracted to the fact that it's not purely academic. I'm not an academic, I've been a practitioner um, for the last decade. So I, I, I really appreciated the opportunity to lend my perspective from the policy space, the actual politis, uh, policy space in, in my work. I think this program is designed for someone that really knows what they want to do. And it's a thing balance. You really know what you want to do so you can come here and really look for the resources that will help you in your path. But at the same time, you need to be open-minded to reshape your idea that you have already before coming here and add new elements and come with something that is, is better that you have already planned. My name is Lotta. I'm a third year uh, doctoral researcher at the Department of Political and Social Sciences. I identify myself as a first generation academic. The EUI has a special initiative for uh, those individuals who identify themselves as first generation academics. Uh, in other words, that means that uh, they grew up uh, in families with parents or guardians who do not have a university degree. We know uh, from some studies and also from academic life in general that first generation uh, academics might face some uh, different obstacles or uh, issues, situations throughout their academic careers that they don't know how to navigate with or they might not have the uh, support to ask from their parents. So the, uh, the purpose of the initiative is uh, inclusiveness and uh, just to en enhance uh, diversity within the academia and provide support networks for these first-generation researchers. So the academic services uh, facilitates uh, kind of like networks uh, or these other areas for exchange uh, through, for example, putting together peer groups or uh, they host meetings for first-generation researchers together with some uh, more senior academics and professors included. Uh, the EUI Alumni Association also provides a mentoring program for those who uh, identify as first-generation researchers. And that being said, equally, some of the professors and senior research fellows at the EUI have made themselves uh, available for individual meetings. For myself, uh, it's more of just a kind of this network I know I can rely on, I can go to people, I have contacts uh, if and when I face some uh, obstacles or issues uh, throughout my career. So it is not just for the moment while you're doing your PhD 